Cask Ale is the lifeblood of the British beer industry and a vital part of our country's culture. It was only a few decades ago that it was all we drank in our pubs, but in the last decade or so it's been in serious, sometimes double-digit decline. The closure of our beautiful pubs and increasingly tight margins in beer all play their part, but there's also been a drop-off in interest in cask ale, especially among younger generations. Its reputation has been damaged by cliches about who drinks it and quality issues related to how hard it is to brew well and serve right. But after eight years of exploring the brewing world, we've come to believe that cask ale at its best is the ultimate way to enjoy beer. We've fallen in love with our traditional pubs, styles, breweries and culture and hate to see it slowly falling apart. So we've decided to do something about it. In a bid to ensure its survival, we've teamed up with Fuller's Brewery and spent the last six months filming stories that we hope will inspire people to get out there and drink cask ale more often. In episode five, we visit the hallowed halls of Fuller's Griffin Brewery to get the story behind one of the UK's most celebrated beers, Vintage Ale. First brewed back in 1997, it predates both craft's rise and cask's decline and has endured as a symbol of both historic and modern brewing. What we learn inspires us to start on an entirely new journey. Hello and welcome to the finale of our adventure into Cask Ale. We've had an incredible journey talking about the heritage, talking about the future, talking about the beautiful pubs that make this scene so special. And this week we are finally joining the people who have made this all possible, Fullers, by talking about Vintage Ale. Why are we going to talk about Vintage Ale? Well that's because we think that of all the beers in this country that could tie it all together and explain what's so great about Cask Ale, what's so great about the scene that's built up around it and why it's so important to save it, then it's Vintage Ale, and we're going to be explaining that right now. At its heart, Vintage Ale is a barley wine that's been brewed once a year at the beautiful and historic Griffin Brewery for 25 years. Unlike most beers which are made to be drunk super fresh, Vintage Ale was designed to be delicious straight from the brewery and a quarter of a century later, and even beyond. And to make sure eager beer geeks kept coming back year after year, Fuller's make every vintage subtly different, playing around with the malts and hops to make each year unique. They've used ingredients from all over the world without ever compromising the idea of that classic English barley wine. With so much history, there's no way that me and Brad could tell the full story, so we went for a beer, okay, a few beers, with industry and Fuller's legend John Keeling. John joined the brewery way back in 1981 and was head brewer for nearly two decades. As he says, I am probably the one that's drank the most vintage ale in, in, in anybody's lifetime. So who better to speak about vintage ale and indeed the fortunes of cask than him? It's a complicated thing, vintage ale, uh, in uh, the first two, the 97 and the 98, were brewed under the previous head brewer, which was Red Strawry. But I was the brewer in charge of the brew house, so I actually brewed it. Right. Yeah. It, but he set the recipe, and we, we talked about it as a group. In that we had, it was originally a marketing idea. Marketing says, "Can we produce a one-off beer once every year that's the equivalent to a vintage wine?" And that was our idea. And we said, "Yes, we can." So myself and Reg put our heads together, and he said, "Look, we can buy uh, malt made from the champion barley of the year. We can buy hops." that have won the hop competition. So let's do it that way, so that we always buy what we consider to be the best. And we then give the hop merchant and the, and the maltster the problem of making sure that they add the barley from the championship field. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that was a, it was a good idea at the time, but unfortunately they, they stopped running those competitions. So you could say, well, brewing from the best ingredients, how do you prove it? But I, and I thought to myself, we, craft brew beer is rising, interest in beer is rising, and, and new hops are arriving, new barley varieties are arriving, new ways of doing things are arriving. We need to be true to ourselves in terms of, we'll keep the recipe the same and we'll always aim for the alcohol content, the bitterness content to be the same, but we'll try and achieve it in different ways. And what that did was enable the brewers to put their own personality into each year's vintage. 
and it also you know makes the brewers really it makes a, the brewing environment really interesting in how how do you decide what what to do and I, I when I was the head brewer I I did not really get involved in the nitty gritty in detail of working out the precise recipe I wanted to set a vision that for this is where the beer should go right and I, then I would say to Derek Prentice or Georgina Right, now you take over and decide how you achieve that. So it became more of a, a, a kind of a team discussion to work yes. out how that's going to end up. And yes, and, and also I would frequently back out because when the head brewer is in them sort of discussions, people are a little bit more limited. Though, if you go and hold them in the pub, which I found out later, was the best place to have those discussions because you'd had a few pints. They weren't bothered. They were quite happy to tell me I was wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, you said that the best discussions happen over a beer. So maybe we should crack yeah. the vintage ale. Um, and it'd be great to hear. I mean, you, you, when did you start at, uh, at Fuller's? Oh, way back in 1981. And that was just as a, like a, an apprentice you, brewer. Yeah. It's a year before I was born. Uh, right. Then, well, then, well, you see, like, I joined them when I was 10. <laughs> of course, of course. Yeah. <coughs> Cheers. Thank you, Johnny. And that's a beautiful looking beer straight out of the Yeah, game. it's got a nice head on it. Oh, gorgeous. Uh, the first vintage I actually brewed is Head Brewers 99. That's the first one I signed. You're still continuing the theme of um, getting the best ingredients. At that point, we was able to do, to do that, but it was, it was becoming increasingly difficult for the hop merchant and, and the, um, the barley guys to actually come up with that because competitions were declining. I remember going to the hop competition and it was presented in the, um, in the Houses of Parliament and uh, it was real fun but I, at that point I was about 46, 47 and I looked around and I was the youngest in there by about 20 years <laughs> and I thought, where is the hop? Growing, going. Yeah. And, and so did, I mean, obviously, Vintage Ale, you have occasionally done like New Zealand hops yeah. and different things, but did that become a little thing that Vintage Ale was supposed to do? It was trying to encourage, you know, the use of British malt, British hops. It, it, no, it, it, I never intended that because I think brewing has become far more international. But also because of that, you're making friends overseas. You're going to judge in competitions in America, in Australia. So you've got to allow that influence to come in. You, you can't stop that. Uh, uh, but what you can do is say, look, we're, we're a British brewery. Yeah? We're in London. We, c we can make these types of beer. But what's more is that I, I look back in our recipe book when we come to do the Past Masters series. And the first Past Masters series, the first one I think was from 1891, and it had Californian hops in, wow, really? in the original recipe. And I thought, well, you know, what comes around, everything goes in circles. <laughs> and because it's, it's now iconic, and because it, it says something not just about Fuller's, but about the brewing industry. It says, yes, a, a traditional company that's been around since 1845 can produce a traditional beer, beer but it can react to new things to what's happening in the world, which surely is to traditional of what brewers have always done. We couldn't put it better ourselves. It may be a barley wine, a style based on the strong, well-aged ales of the 19th century. It may only be on cask or bottle conditioned. It may be malt lead and have more in common with a best bitter than a New England IPA. But this, to us, is craft beer. Considered, experimental, flavor forward, and using cutting edge ingredients and processes. So what does Fuller's Vintage Ale 2021 have in store for us? To find out, we headed to Fuller's in Chiswick, way back on a crisp, cold March day. Happily, the exact day they were brewing it. To witness this special beer being made was, to say the least, a bit exciting for me, as was getting the tour and the chance to talk through the recipe with current head brewer Guy Stewart, who was leading just his second ever Vintage Ale. What was it like to be, you know, had you ever worked on the Vintage Ale recipe before? as part of the team? No, well, I'd sort of been involved with it, but it was more sort of George, what she wanted to do before then, and then it was John before him, mm -hmm. although George had had a big say in the ones, all the ones I'd done when I was here. So it was sort of my responsibility, so it was like, there you go. 
Away you go. It's yours now, yeah. yeah. So what did you want to do with that, that first vintage in um, 2020? I wanted to sort We'd done some things over sort of 2016. I think we'd used Denali hops. 2019, we'd done sort of a bit of a New Zealand theme. So we'd used some uh, Gladfield Crystal and some Watiti hops. So I wanted to sort of go back to British English. Um, so all British ingredients. So we used Jester and Godiva and then all British malt. And this year's, uh, this year's recipe, you said it's, it's a similar grist? Similar grist last to last year. year. I like last year's grist. I like the way the double roasted crystal from Simpsons worked with it. Um, so I thought I'd sort of stick with the basics of last year, although I put some caragold from French and Jups in to sort of add a little bit of sort of extra sweetness, caramelly notes. Uh, and then getting, again, hops. I went to Charles Farham. I said, look, what have you got that's English that's new? or relatively new. So I've got uh, Endeavour, which has been out probably 15, 16 years, so that's not overly new. Uh, Olicana, which has been out probably five or six years, and then a, a variety that doesn't even have a name. But Lovingly it's got to be called CF182. Yeah, just want to drink um, that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is from the Charles Farham breeding yeah. programme. So, so what are we expecting? So Olicana seems like it's used modern parlance. It might be a little bit juicy. It's got yeah, so we were sticking that in fermenter to sort of try and get up the fruit levels a bit. Uh, the Endeavour, hopefully a bit of sort of um, plummy, black currenty notes. And the 182 is a bit orangey spicy. So that should work with the Fuller's Yeast quite well because that gives you fruit cakey, orangey sort of notes and then just a little bit of fruit to lift it up. Mm. And, and what about the yeast? So Fuller's, you have a, a house yeast that, that yeah, goes Fuller's across yeast. pretty much all the... Yeah, I use it in most things. Um, and Fuller's Yeast, if you want to find out what Fuller's Yeast does, if you drink, to me, if you drink ESB, you know, that is your classic Fuller's Yeast. It's mm -hmm. sort of orangey, fruit cake, then sort of dry at the end. And the hops we used last year worked well with it, and hopefully the sort of spicy orangey notes we get from the 182 this year will work well with it and sort of help accentuate those flavours and bring it out. What's, what's it like to brew a beer that, you know, each time you do it, it's a brand new recipe? Is there a lot of, a lot of pressure not to put something together that might contrast too much? Or... Yeah, because cause there's, no, there's no trial, there's no dress rehearsal, you make it and it's like, ah, right, okay, yeah. yes. So, yeah, especially last year, I was very, very nervous of the fact that I'd not done it before. Yeah. And I spent a lot of time writing and calculating and then redoing it again and then going out for again and again and again. And because I, I was working from home at the time, yeah, I'd probably drive my family mad. <laughs> Whereas this year I was slightly more relaxed in that that's why I've sort of kept the grist similar because I knew that worked last year. You had year. it locked in, yeah. Yeah. So then it was just a matter of playing with the hops. Yeah. So and hopefully. Is, is it a lot of extra pressure? You know, it was, you know, this beer is, is one of the most loved in the in the uk it's one of the yeah. you know we talk about a lot of modern sort of ipas and stuff getting cues and getting people very excited for each annual release this was one of the originators of that back in the yeah. 90s um so it, it must have been nerve-wracking a lot, a lot of pressure a beer. lot of pressure I, it, I, we did a tasting and you know john said he really liked it which was quite a big tick yeah. in the box for me Fingers crossed the 2021 vintage gets the same reaction, but we'd have to wait nearly six months to find out. This was the first thing we shot for our Keep Cask Alive series, so while we spent the spring and summer travelling the UK to tell all the other stories, the vintage ale was busy fermenting, then maturing, then conditioning in cask until mid-September, when we were invited back for a special vertical tasting of several vintage ales from the past, including the very first one ever made from 1997. You just drank about 15 quid's worth of beer there, Brad. Oh, don't I know it. <laughs> but really, we were there to try the 2021 version on cask, which we got to do with Guy in a pub down the road just after. There he told us what had happened to the beer since March before we got to be one of the first people to taste it. It's in fermenter for about a week or so, then centrifuged into conditioning tank, sat in conditioning tank at eight degrees for until July. So it's, all, it's almost a lagering process. It's not as cold, but it's conditioned yeah, yeah. for a long time. Yeah, yeah. If you think actually it's then going to end up in bottle as well for... Yeah, 10, to bottle condition 15, and, yeah. 20 years. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, so it's sat in tank 
for, well, till July, then rack some into Perkin, and the rest of it into bottle. So when, when we tasted it on bottle, it had a beautiful, like a really tropical note to it, comparative to, to other vintage ales or other barley yeah. wines that we've had. A really beautiful, uh, but still quite restrained kind of tropical yeah. orange zest kind yeah, of note I, to I it. I get a lot of apricot on it. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, so those British hops have really done a huge amount of work to sort of yeah, yeah. make that beer individual. Um, how, how's that going to present and compare to, uh, to, how's this going to compare to the bottle version? Oof. Well, I think the cask will be less, once you stick it in the bottle, from the moment you stick it in the bottle, it's going to change. And it will, I mean, that change might, it will be very, very slow. Um, but in the cask, there's less yeast in it. It's kept in a cold room. So our cask storerooms at sort of eight, nine, 10 degrees. Um, so you, and the yeast count is lower on it. So you get less changing of the flavors. So, I mean, it's a lot. So it's sort of closer to the brewery fresh thing, which is what we yeah, talk yeah. about with cask all yeah, the yeah. time. It's like as close yeah. as you're going to get to. So this, to me, fresh. this is more tropical on the nose. I, I get more tropical on the nose, but I also get quite orangey. Mm. And then, ooh, I think it's quite spicy, which is what I got, I think, with the, the, um, the CF-182. Opus now. Opus now. Um, gives it that sort of spicy, peppery, almost. Yeah. And also, I get a lot more orange in this than I get in the bottle. Yeah. So I think that orange in the bottle is probably morphed into what, I, what I'm now picking up as apricot. So what I really love about this beer and the reason that we put it as our final episode is the way that particularly with this year's recipe you brought you know, some incredibly forward thinking and using brand new British hops that you know, even modern craft brewers haven't totally latched onto yet. But with this classic style, the classic traditions, the kit that you're still using at Fuller's and the, the traditions that you have, do you see, you know, weirdly, vintage ale despite being 25 years old, having more of a future than it ever has because of those sort of yeah i think clashes we've now got we've got the opportunity because there's so many new hops coming out and, and different ingredients to do something different every year to do something the same but different which i know sounds like a terrible cliche yeah but you know there's lots of new hops coming out everybody's you know there's lots of different malts we haven't used you know, there's always something new we can try or different combinations of ingredients we've not used before. So I think you've got, you know, we know where the basis is, you've got a nice steady base and then it's just, you know, it's almost like a fancy cake and you can put different icing on the top each time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that, that's a, you know, a benefit of car scale because every time you do it, it's going to be incredibly fresh, incredibly vibrant and you're going to know exactly what it is that you did. Yeah. Because it's straight out of the brewery, it's, it's as fresh as it's, as it's going to be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for, for talking right. us through this entire process. It's been an absolute honour to see right. Vintage Ale made and then to taste it in just like this. I'm glad you like it. I mean, it's absolutely delicious. So there it is. A beer based on a centuries-old style, brewed to a decades-old recipe, but using brand new British hops. To us, Vintage Ale does a great job of showing everything we've talked about in this series. It shows what's possible with cask, and that is absolutely anything. The only limit is the talent of the brewers, the care of the publicans, and the demands of the drinker. All three of those things are at risk though if pubs are forced to focus on more profitable things and drinkers lose touch with this glorious way of serving beer. After everything we've learned, Brad and I are more determined than ever to do our bit, so we grabbed a pint back at the Southampton Arms and started to put a plan together. So we're back at the Southampton Arms where this all started. Six months we've been filming this series of documentaries. And I, you know, everything has changed for me. The, my perspective on car scale, my perspective on pubs, the breweries that I look out for when I go to pubs, and my understanding of what a perfectly kept car scale is. I'm not sure I really understood it until, until this year. No, I don't think I'd be remiss in saying that this has been a life altering and habit changing experience for the both of us. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of broadened my horizons. When, when I used to go into a craft beer bar or you know, a car scale focused one, I'd be looking for particular breweries. And from what I've learned from visiting Hook Norton, Abbeydale, Darkstar, Fuller's, all of these amazing brewers that I wouldn't necessarily look for on the bar uh, a year ago, yeah. I'm now, you know, 
if I see old hooky on, I'm like just as excited as I was when I saw you know the modern stuff that we've always covered on the channel more. Um, and I, I think that's going to continue for a long time because of the stories that we've seen. You know, we know what these car scales have gone through to be brewed, the incredible history of it, and then what it's taken to care for it. We started this this journey together, Johnny, knowing that car scale was in trouble. But I think what we've realised is that there's so much hope, there's so much light at the end of the tunnel. At this point, I think there's two things that we can do at the Craft Beer Channel. The first one of them we want your help with, and that's evangelising about how great cask beer is. Um, drink it, rate it, tell everyone you know how amazing it is. Whenever you have a great pint, celebrate it. Absolutely, and the other thing that we need to do is take this out of the beer bubble and get help in protecting not, not just its future, but also its past. Yes. And I think that the best way that we can do that is to take a leaf out of the Belgians' books, mm. and we need to go to UNESCO, and we need to ask for cask ale, that traditional way of serving, to be protected as an intangible asset of value, to say to the world that this is a beautiful bit of heritage, it's a beautiful bit of the future, and we need to make sure that it can have that future. And by getting it listed by UNESCO, getting it protected by UNESCO, we can say to the UK government that there needs to be, you know, maybe some tax benefits for cask ale producers, or maybe there needs to be some kind of drop in the duty on certain kinds uh, of, of beer serving, particularly cask ale. Because once we have that UNESCO backing, we will be able to say to the world that we have something precious, vital, unique, traditional and futuristic that needs to be assured. Cask Ale is a fundamental part of Britain's brewing history and culture and needs to be a part of its future. Absolutely, so join with us and keep Cask Ale alive.